In 1880, there are 38 states and 50 million people, most of whom live on farms or in rural communities. However, with new waves of immigration from Europe, the population begins to shift from rural to urban. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. For millions of immigrants, the Statue of Liberty, a gift of friendship from France, is a bright symbol of hope a promise of a better life in a land where freedom and justice reign. At the dedication ceremony in 1886, President Grover Cleveland promises, we will not forget that liberty has here made her home, nor shall her chosen altar be neglected. Yet for most immigrants, the better life is not immediate. Literally dumped on lower Manhattan Island, they pile on top of each other in teeming tenement districts. In some places, more than half a million people to the square mile. America, however, is the land of opportunity. The popular books of Horatio Alger tell how poor young men become astoundingly wealthy. And there are living examples. Alexander Graham Bell was a school teacher before he invented the telephone. Andrew Carnegie, a bobbin boy in a cotton factory. During his lifetime, he gives away $350 million. John D. Rockefeller, whose Standard Oil Company controls 90% of the nation's oil business, began as a bookkeeper. Another factor that enhances bank accounts is the absence of any personal income tax. In the 1880s, Americans not only can go from poor to rich in a hurry, they can travel from coast to coast in the record time of seven days. By 1890, four railroads have spanned the continent. And to make railroad time schedules less complicated, the nation is divided into four separate time zones. In the eastern time zone, a spectacular cog railway carries passengers to the 6,000-foot summit of New Hampshire's Mount Washington. Sitting squarely in the path of three major storm systems, New England's highest peak has some of the most devastating weather on the continent. P.T. Barnum calls it the second greatest show on Earth. In the mountain time zone, narrow gauge steam trains snake their way through valleys and over mountaintops, right into the heart of the Rocky Mountains. Throughout the Rockies, from the territory of Montana to the territory of New Mexico, miners are tearing into hillsides hoping to find the glory hole that will transform a life of labor into a life of ease. In Leadville, Colorado, storekeeper Horace Tabor parlays a small grub stake into a fabulous fortune. Earnings from his matchless mine give Tabor the title Silver King. In 1883, he grabs headlines by divorcing his wife and marrying a wide-eyed beauty called Baby Doe. The wedding takes place in Washington, D.C., a lavish affair attended by the president and congressman. After 10 years, the matchless plays out, and so does Tabor's health. On his deathbed, he tells Baby Doe, hang on to the matchless. She does, and 40 years later, she dies there in extreme poverty. In southwestern Colorado, another treasure is uncovered. 
the magnificent ruins of Mesa Verde. Sometime during the 13th century, Indian cliff dwellers built these remarkable stone cities. After living there for about a hundred years, they mysteriously abandoned them. May 24th, 1883, New York's biggest celebration since the opening of the Erie Canal. After 14 years of construction, the Brooklyn Bridge connects two of America's largest cities, Brooklyn and New York. Billed as the eighth wonder of the world, this gigantic suspension bridge features a wide promenade in the center for bicycling and strolling. The mayor of Brooklyn writes, no one who has ever been upon it can ever forget it. No one shall see it and not be prouder to be a human being. Two years later, in 1885, a monument to the memory of America's first president is finally completed. Fifteen years to plan, nearly 40 years to build. This austere obelisk is applauded as a fitting tribute to the soldier statesman who was first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. Twenty presidents later, and after only five months in office, James Garfield is fatally shot by a disgruntled office seeker who claims he wasn't given a promised public office. A New York Tribune headline reads, Killed by the Spoil System. After Vice President Chester Arthur takes office, he strongly supports the Pendleton Act which calls for appointments to be made not by the political party in power, but by the newly created civil service system. Elected in 1884, Grover Cleveland is the first Democratic president since before the Civil War. Cleveland's administration is baffled by an unusual problem. What is to be done with the huge surplus of money in the national treasury? The president tries to get the high tariff on imports lowered, but the Republican Congress balks. Both agree to reduce postage rates from three to two cents. While in office, the 49-year-old bachelor marries Frances Folsom. At 21, she is the youngest first lady to occupy the White House. For their honeymoon, they go where every self-respecting couple who can afford it goes. Niagara Falls. In the election of 88, Cleveland wins the popular vote, but Benjamin Harrison gets more electoral votes and becomes president. Although women are permitted to vote in some state elections, only men have the right to vote in national elections. Despite efforts by social reformers such as Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, women's voting rights are 30 years away. In 1889, President Harrison makes an official proclamation. At 12 noon, April 22nd, certain Indian lands will be open to white settlement. Thousands of boomers rush to Oklahoma territory. Those who jump the starting gun to file claims are called Sooners. For Indian nations, it is one more phase of resettlement or perhaps banishment. During the 1880s, final resistance to white expansion is crushed. In 81, Sitting Bull, the revered Sioux medicine man, surrenders. In 86, Geronimo, the elusive Apache, is captured. 
Their land is gone, and so is the one animal they depend upon for survival. Back in 1869, a Kansas Pacific train waited eight hours for a buffalo herd to pass. Now, unrestricted slaughter has brought them to near extinction. As buffalo disappear, the open range is filled with Texas longhorns. The great cattle drives from Texas to the rip-roaring railhead towns of Kansas, Abilene, Ellsworth, Wichita, Dodge City. However, by the late 1880s, more and more grassland is being turned upside down. Prairie cow towns are becoming somewhat respectable. Cattle barons are fencing off large permanent ranches, and the legendary cowboy is more often than not a hired hand who mends fences. Even Buffalo Bill has quit the frontier to sell the Old West to city slickers. And with railroads crossing and crisscrossing the nation, Wild West shows heading east past circus trains going west. Stage plays, operas, Chautauqua lectures, vaudeville acts are touring the country. And Broadway personalities, opera stars, and stump speakers are becoming household names. Edwin Booth, Lillian Russell, Sarah Bernhardt, Lily Langtree, William Jennings Bryan. HMS Pinafore. The Mikado. Operettas by Gilbert and Sullivan play to packed houses, whether on Broadway or in Muncie, Indiana. New York City, the Metropolitan Opera opens a new season with a new building, a full city block square. <laughs> Yet for most Americans in the 80s, entertainment is homegrown. Nearly every small town has at least one band. And the rousing tunes of John Philip Sousa elevate brass concert music to a new level. A favorite pastime is gathering in the parlor to sing old tunes and hits of the day. Sentimental ballads like Poverty's Tears Ebb and Flow or send me a rose from my angel mother's grave. Ben-Hur by General Lew Wallace is the best-selling novel of the decade. And Mark Twain, writing from his elegant home in Hartford, Connecticut, completes Life on the Mississippi, a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court, and his masterpiece, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. In 1888, baseball's immortal poem, Casey at the Bat, is written by a San Francisco newspaper columnist. Baseball, during the 80s, undergoes significant change. In 84, pitchers, for the first time, are allowed to throw overhand. Catchers move up behind the plate instead of catching the ball on one bounce. Although the catcher's mitt is the first glove to be worn, only sissies use it. We use no mattress on our hands, no cage upon our face. We stand right up and catch the ball with courage 
and with grace. Uncivilized, disgusting, football is considered a game for brutes and barbarians. contest resembles the English sport of rugby until Walter Camp introduces a series of rules that includes a stationary line of scrimmage and a center snap to the quarterback. Like baseball, football is sparse on equipment. Players do not wear pads or helmets. In football there are no coaches and no professional teams and the game is still true to its name. Field goals usually done by drop kicking count more than touchdowns. As for basketball, it will not be invented until 1891. After vacationing in Scotland, George Fox returns to the rolling hills of western Pennsylvania and builds one of America's first golf courses on his country estate. Chartered in 1887, the nine-hole Foxburg Golf Club is the oldest course in continuous use in the United States. Golf in its early stages is primarily a sport for the wealthy, even though quart tomato cans are used for cups and well-oiled burlap bags smooth over sand greens. I can lick any man in the house. Boston strong boy John L. Sullivan backs up his haughty challenge in and out of the ring. Voted athlete of the decade, Sullivan defeats Jake Kilrain in 1889 for the Bare Knuckle Championship. It is the last major fight where contestants do not wear padded gloves. If Sullivan is king of sports, then Thomas Edison is the reigning emperor of science. His two recent inventions, the phonograph and the electric light bulb, have shaken the scientific world. In a very short time, they will conquer the rest of the world. However, when asked about his accomplishments, the wizard of Menlo Park replies that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. In 87, Edison moves his laboratory from Menlo Park to West Orange, New Jersey. Here he attempts to do for the eye what the phonograph did for the ear. Edward Mybridge had recently demonstrated that a series of still photographs spinning in motion give the illusion of movement. In 89, Edison uses George Eastman's new celluloid film, projects a series of photographs on a screen, and in so doing, invents the motion picture. George Eastman calls his new camera Kodak. Instead of cumbersome glass plates, it uses roll-type film. After clicking off 100 shots, both film and camera are sent to Eastman's laboratory in Rochester, New York. After the film is developed, the camera is reloaded and returned, all for $10. This process can be standardized, mass-produced. It will soon make picture-taking a family institution. During the 80s, there are other firsts, the fountain pen. The first long-distance phone call from Boston to Providence, Rhode Island. Richard Warren Sears publishes his first catalog. The Salvation Army branches from England to America. In 81, the American Red Cross is founded by Clara Barton. Its first big test comes eight years later. When a fragile earth dam collapses, a wall of water in some places seven stories high smashes through Johnstown, Pennsylvania, killing over 2,000 people in a matter of minutes. The Johnstown flood is one of the great disasters in American history. 
claiming that the Red Cross is always the last to leave, Clara stays five months, winning the gratitude of the townspeople and the respect of the entire nation. Also during the 80s, trains and streetcars are, for the first time, powered by electricity. Electricity is stronger than horses and more versatile than cables. Before long, the clanging bells of trolley cars will be heard far beyond city limits. However, over dirt roads, and most roads are dirt, Nearly all vehicles are horse-drawn. One exception is the bicycle, and the new low-wheeled safety bike brings riding down to earth, making it popular to millions. At one time, canals were hailed as the answer to America's transportation problems, but most were financial failures. The Erie Canal, however, is so successful it eliminates tolls in 1882. In the 80s, railroads are by far the chief means of transportation. They have replaced steamboat passenger service and are majestically moving into their golden age. 60 years will go by before automobiles and airplanes challenge railroad supremacy. The architecture of this era varies greatly, but above everything else, it reflects the full bloom of the Victorian age, that period of history named after England's Queen Victoria. If their houses are over-decorated, then the people who live inside them are certainly overdressed. Modesty rises to a fine art, or cult. Bodies are clothed from head to foot, and young people are watched by ever-present chaperones. Small boys are dressed in little Lord Fauntleroy outfits, complete with ruffles and dangling love locks. Fashionable women are tied tight about the waist with corsets and pushed out the back with bustles. Later on, the 80s look begins to take on straighter lines, but could still be summarized by the motto, more is better. That motto would not apply to education. The majority of schoolhouses are one or two rooms, and one or two schoolmasters teach all grades. In rural areas, classes are held for about five months each year, six days a week, 10 hours a day. Only a handful of students graduate and go on to college, to colleges that are not coeducational. If a teacher performs all duties faithfully for five years, this includes washing windows, cleaning chimneys, and checking outhouses. For men, it means not rolling up their sleeves or going to a barber shop. For women, it means not getting married or letting their bustle extend more than 10 inches. Then, after five years, they will be given a pay raise of 25 cents per week. Providing, that is, the Board of Education approves. In the medical profession, doctors are not well educated, nor are they well paid. Medical students, if they can afford it, attend colleges in Europe. Specialists are rare, and most family doctors learn their trade through on-the-job training with older family doctors. On the frontier, doctors often run the local drugstore, Their hottest selling items are patent medicines, 
advertised to positively cure everything from hiccups to hysteria. Whatever they claim to cure, most remedies bring the illusion of well-being since they are heavily laced with alcohol. Even though the plains are becoming settled, the West still has pockets of lawlessness, especially in the mining boom towns of the Southwest. Tombstone, Arizona Territory, October 1881. After a year of feuding, the Clanton and McClory brothers square off against Sheriff Wyatt Earp, his two brothers, and Doc Holliday. In less than one minute, the gunfight at the OK Corral leaves three wounded and three dead. Earlier that year, in the territory of New Mexico, 21-year-old Billy the Kid is gunned down by Marshal Pat Garrett. A year later, Missouri's famous outlaw, Jesse James, is shot in the back of the head while straightening a picture in his St. Joseph home. Killed by gang member Bob Ford for the reward money, James' death marks the beginning of the end for the romanticized period of the outlaw. By the late 1880s, men who could rob a bank or train and stay alive long enough to brag about it were becoming as rare as the buffalo. In large towns and cities, people claim there are outlaws wearing business suits. Instead of toting six guns, they carry checkbooks, contracts, and mortgages. To fight back, working classes form unions. In 1886, a nationwide strike for an eight-hour day climaxes at Haymarket Square in Chicago. Strikers and police clash. A bomb is thrown. Seventeen people die. Nearly 50 are wounded. Later that year, Samuel Gompers starts the American Federation of Labor. The Department of Agriculture is agitated into existence as farmers fight railroads, bankers, and the federal government. With crop prices falling and interest rates rising, farmers join the National Grange, an organization destined to become a powerful political force in the 1890s. New Year's Day, 1890. An editorial in the New York Tribune states, Rarely does a year begin with fairer promise of beneficence in all that concerns the national well-being. Although there is separation by geography and enterprise, the nation as a whole is coming together. As the South recovers from the straitjacket of Reconstruction, the industrialized Northeast becomes more industrialized. In California, irrigation is transforming desert wasteland into an agricultural bonanza. Between 1880 and 1890, California doubles its population. During this same 10-year period, four states join the Union, and the United States increases its population by 13 million for a total of 63 million. Of these 63 million, nearly 50% now live in cities. In 1890, the Census Bureau officially declares that the frontier is closed. And that seemingly endless land, always west, is there no more.
This was a part of Boston in the 1870s, the age of Longfellow and Emerson and Lowell, of hoop skirts and bustles, of gallantry and sideburns and most fastidious manners known as genteel. Telegraph, just reaching our furthermost boundaries, was a common tool in Boston, the most familiar forerunner of the electric age. But still, this was the gaslight era. today about the speed of light and the speed of sound? Much faster, much faster. Well, light is so fast that we see the lightning almost exactly when it happens. But um, what about the noise it makes, the uh, thunder? That's a lot slower. That's right. Thunder, the sound of lightning, comes to us at about a thousand feet a second. So with a little arithmetic, you can tell from that how far away the lightning is. You know how? We'd just as soon not know how close it is, eh, Sonny? <laughs> How can you tell? As simple as one, two, three. When the lightning flashes, count the seconds until the thunder comes. A second equals a thousand feet. There. One, two, three, four. Peter, four seconds away, so... Four times one thousand. Good. So the lightning was... 4,000 feet away from me. <laughs> Pretty close, that. Very close. Thunderation. Too dagnab close for your sincerely Willis J. Walton. <laughs> that was a real rip snorter. I guess there's one advantage to being deep like those dummies over there. They haven't been scared. Just look at them chattering away. There are no advantages I can think of to being deaf. There is a special disadvantage, I should say, in being deaf to warnings of danger. Well, that's one way of looking at it. Better be dumb than deep is what I say. But I guess they go together, right? Wrong. What did you say? I took leave to differ with you. I said wrong. I couldn't hear you. It looked like you said wrong. That's what I did say. I said wrong, and you read my lips. I can't read lips. Nobody can. And when you're deep, you're dumb. My dear sir, the organs of speech are in no way affected by deafness. The deaf person is mute simply because he cannot hear and hasn't been taught to speak. A contradiction in terms, sir. A most illogical contradiction. The deep mute speech organs may be intact, agreed. But if he can't hear a word, how? How in the name of all that's sensible is he, an idiot, going to learn to say it? Mr. Walton, my hearing must be failing me. I could have sworn you used the word idiot. I did. And in many states, the law classifies them as idiots. And that's practical. No speech, no language. And you can't think without language. And you can't undo the work of the Almighty. The Almighty is far more merciful to the deaf child than we, Mr. Walton. Than we? What do you mean? Nature inflicted upon the deaf child but one flaw. One little flaw, imperfect hearing. But we deny him speech by not teaching him to speak. And language by not teaching him to read. Sentimental balderdash. Monumental poppycock. Good afternoon, Mr. Walton. Goodbye. Goodbye, you arithmetic scholar. He can't hear you, Mr. Walton. I can never hear you. He's deaf. He was born deaf. Well, for goodness sakes. Who was that with the deep boy? Him? Bell's the name. Professor Alexander Graham Bell. Young for a professor, but they say he comes from a family of teachers and writers. Guess he got started early. A Scottish family, the Bells. They settled in Brantford, Canada. They teach people to talk, to talk clearly, 
all kinds of people, stuttering folks, children, and important people too, ministers and judges and political leaders. This young Bell's father, it said in the paper, publishes many books that go by thousands all over the world, even to China. Can you imagine teaching people to say their words just right? Bell now, he lectures at the university and he teaches the deaf to speak with some kind of system his father invented. The deaf can't hear, but there's a deaf young lady here in Boston they say can understand speech very well. That's Miss Mabel Hubbard, daughter of Gardner Green Hubbard. You've heard of Gardner Hubbard, lawyer and street railway man. One of our great families, the Hubbards. Well, they say the way this Miss Hubbard can talk and understand is a wonder. I guess she understands young Professor Bell all right. If all goes in dearing young John, which I gave on so fondly today, were to change by tomorrow and bleed in my arms like. Good evening, sir. Did you know that if we had two pianos here and I struck this G, the G of the second instrument would start? I suppose that second hypothetical piano could be made to play sympathetically the whole of endearing young charm. Mm -hmm. Abel, darling, I'm going to say a few serious words to this young man. Do you want to stay? I shall do some plain talking. Stay, Father. Very well, you stay. Now, Mr. Bell, you listen to me. We've gone into business together, you and I. Yes? When you outlined your idea of finding a way to send several Morse telegraph messages at the same time over one wire, we arranged, without formalities, without contracts, for me to enter into your plans as a partner. Do you remember that? Of course I remember. You and Mr. Sanders were to supply the costs of the experiment. You want an accountant? I certainly do. Father. You are squandering, or at least mismanaging, the only essential asset we have in this enterprise. Do you know what that is? I quite fail to follow. If you think for a moment... Keep your seat, Mr. Bell. The only thing we can't get on without is you. Now, I haven't had detectives following you. It just happens quite by chance, by chance meetings with various acquaintances of mine and admirers of yours around Boston today, that I'm able to follow your activities in some detail. At nine o'clock, you are lecturing at Boston University. The power of this apparatus, gentlemen, is to me almost the unsurpassed marvel of nature. This is a formidable piece of machinery, even in the ear of a baby. And yet, the buzz of the gnat a dried leaf tumbled in the wind has the power to move it, to make a telegraph to the brain. By 11 o'clock, you had reached the Fuller School. The school has three good teachers now, but you stayed there for three hours and had nothing to eat but cake. How you reached the normal school by three o'clock, only you know. But there you were, starting a new class of prospective teachers for the deaf. I presume you've been in the laboratory since then. Oh, yes. Yes, sir, and I must tell Mr. you... Mr. Bell, Mr. Bell, these are all highly praiseworthy activities. I wouldn't have you drop them forever, but you've gone into business. I realize that, Gone but into business with Tom Sanders and me to develop this new harmonic telegraph, a highly commercial and probably enriching enterprise. Remember? It seems to me that if you gave your full attention to the telegraph, you'd soon have time and funds for other things and for work on that obsession of yours, the transmission of speech by telegraph wire. Oh, yes. I just hope for all of our sakes that you slow down before you break. 
I realize that, sir. Please forgive me. I am not well organized, but I came here to tell you something. Something amazing. Beyond anything we've foreseen. Uh, this, this is a reed, Mabel. This simple little thing. We tune them, you see. Two of them tuned to the same pitch will vibrate together when electric current is applied to them. Well, presumably, reeds differently tuned on the same line will not react. He means all reeds will be silent unless they receive impulses from instruments tuned to them. Exactly. And the same wire, we hope, may be used for many telegraph messages at one time. Now, Tom Watson and I were preparing for a test. I was adjusting this reed, this very reed, in this manner. Watson was in another room operating the transmitting reed when, when I heard something. It was like nothing ever heard before. Yes, Al. I uh, ran to Watson and said, what happened? What did you do? What had he done? This. Just this. Hear it? A slight twang, Mabel. A piece of metal vibrating. And so, Mr. Bell, what was the wonderful thing that you heard? Well, this same sound. Diminished. The murmur of it. This. Really, Alec. Don't you see? Tell us, Alec. A sound was transmitted. Not a signal, not the clack of a telegraph. This little thing moving over this coil had generated an infinitesimal current, varying, modulated like speech. It came from Watson over there to my reed over here. It duplicated exactly the sound over there in this reed in my hand. So simple. I must say I'm still at sea. If Watson's voice had vibrated his reed, I should have heard Watson's voice on my reed. But you didn't hear it. How could you? Well, by using a parchment diaphragm, sir. A diaphragm attached to the reed. By a diaphragm, very like the top of this hat. You try it, I suppose? Of course. Tonight, in an hour. Watson has been working on it all day. All ship shape, Mr. Watson? All ready, Mr. Bell. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, Tom? Yes, sir. I should say something rather special. What if I can? Well, go to your post, my friend, and listen. Yes. A little well. I'm, I'm sure it was your voice. I couldn't make out the words. I couldn't just catch them. Now, everyone may not know that this first telephone was scientifically correct in principle, and that the original instrument has worked many times since under more favorable conditions. Bell himself couldn't know this at the time. So months of Tireless study and rebuilding. Endless testing went by. Months went by and winter came before the telephone performed a characteristic service with its first intelligible sentence. Mr. Watson. Mr. Watson. Come here. 
telephone was a fact. But for all the acclaim of science, Bell still faced a skeptical business world that had to be shown the practical uses of the telephone. So he must perforce barnstorm with this great instrument of communication, hide his impatience, prove the obvious. He must have the good Watson serenade across the Hudson to the doubting Thomases of finance. From New Brunswick, New Jersey to New York, Watson serenaded the curious. I am the invisible Tom Watson. Everybody hears me. Nobody sees me. Ahoy! Ahoy, Mr. Watson. Will you oblige us with a song? <clears throat> all right, all right. <clears throat> in some haste to invent the telephone, for it has urgent work to do. Talks, sings, makes you laugh. Quite an entertainment, yes. But I want to see it buckle down and work. In my view of the future, the novelty will wear off. The instrument will be refined. It will grow light, convenient, and familiar to every hand. A common tool within the means of every factory, business, every home. And connected to a central switching office which can connect any two subscribers in a matter of seconds. And then I see its lines and poles marching thousands of miles. Connecting the head office of every city in the land to the head office of every other city. And then I see, perhaps, in the next century, the tiniest, farthest hamlet woven into the wire fabric. Doctors summoned. Disasters met and overcome. So that was Bill in 1876. When I was your age, starting in here at the laboratory, that's what impressed me most about Bell. Having done this great thing right at the start. <laughs> I used to say that's the way I'll handle my career. However, now that the boy has grown older, you know I get the same inspiration from the way he has carried on. In all directions. The variety of the man's thinking. At 37, take a case. He developed with two associates the wax phonograph record, financed it with an award from France for telephonic achievement. And all the earnings of the phonograph record patent 
went to founding the Association to Aid the Deaf. He initiated and extended the National Geographic Society's magazine. Reaches a lot of people now. And then the airplane. When Bell met Len Curtis and other aviation pioneers, it was much as your life was worth to back heavier than aircraft. But from that meeting of minds, the association then formed, came new ways of controlling flight. But he never forgot the death. He spent six years without compensation, taking a national census of the death. And it all ties together somehow, widening horizons for the death, widening horizons of the mind, communications, transportation, Yes, you're lucky to be hearing him today. Lucky. He's 74 now. Gentlemen, young gentlemen, it, um, was suggested when I was invited here that I speak to you, the laboratory's newest, youngest engineer about the telephone. But to tell you the truth, I am sure that in your technical training, you have learned more about the telephone than I ever shall know. Thousands of patents and procedures and devices have been added since last I concerned myself with it. And uh, I must confess that I haven't kept track. The telephone system today is a blend of thousands of minds and ideas. The first telephone also was a blend of many minds. No invention really can belong to one mind alone. Realize, gentlemen, there are no soloists, no prima donnas in science or engineering. One cannot learn enough alone. And I think it is this interdependence and the realization of it that tends to make science virtuous and not even harmonious and not discordant. Sometimes a junior scientist has fixed me with a jaundiced eye and charged, your generation has done it all. Everything is invented, Finish. To this I say, I say it to you, as long as man suffers and wants and wonders, science's work is hardly begun. No doubt, some young scientist at this moment is dreaming a dream or writing an equation which within your lifetime will tap some source of universal power and dwarf all our engines and dynamos. What should you work upon in the laboratory of the shop? Well, my ideas are limited. Such as they are, I do not hoard them. I take the liberty of offering a few examples. Years ago, using a substance whose resistance changes according to the light that falls upon it, I managed to telephone for a short distance without wires along a beam of sunlight. And perhaps there is for you to find a way to make the light that passes through motion picture film reproduce the voice with clarity and range. Brother. I suggest that disasters such as the Titanic encountered in the North Atlantic are unnecessary. There is a means, if you can but find it, of utilizing the echo 
principle. So that a ship's bridge may see or feel or hear an iceberg in time to change a ship's course. I give you one of my failures to ponder. It has been very dear to me throughout my life. Before the telephone, I tried to build a device to record the human voice in visual readable symbols. This, if you succeed, can have several practical applications. The immediate one will immeasurably benefit the deaf. You will understand why this means so much to me. By profession, by personal wish and instinct, I have always been a teacher of the deaf. This, then, is an assignment from me to you. A rather special thing in the greater picture of science. But, young gentlemen, I toss you that brand with this final word. Do not neglect those obscure corners where men work to discover the unknown, to prove the intangible. For here is dawn coming up. Here is tomorrow. scientific minds working together in many places have since brought forth much that Bell's prophetic vision foresaw. The motion picture was given a voice. Radio and television were perfected. Life-saving mechanisms of sonar and radar were designed. They have succeeded too, as he hoped they would, in turning spoken words into visible symbols that deaf children can learn to read as the words are spoken. In the laboratories that now bear his name, Bell's scientific heirs have taken a leading part over the years in the research that made all these things possible. Yet these are but eddies in the main channel of telephone research, as step by step we move toward the realization of Bell's early dream his dream of a day when anyone, anywhere, can talk clearly and at a moment's notice with anyone, anywhere else. And let us pray that come it may, as come it will for our lap, that man to man the world o'er shall brothers be for our lap.